Uh, before we start, um, I got a tip by email, so, so thanks to Edwin. Um, recent article in, in the New York Times about neutrinos, so happy to see everyone out there detecting news about neutrinos. And this in particular was about neutrinos um, coming from nuclear reactors, and they can use them to detect, say, a secret nuclear program. Um, so one very nice kind of application of neutrino physics in the news, and we'll actually be coming back to this topic to talk about neutrinos and nuclear reactors uh, in a couple of weeks, like on April 28th, we'll, we'll hit that topic. So, very good to see. Uh, on the note of the schedule, uh, so this is sort of where we're headed. Uh, a couple of uh, adjustments relative to last week, but I think this will be it. Um, so, for the next few lectures, we'll focus on sort of neutrino astrophysics, what we can learn about neutrinos from the universe, and what we can learn about the universe through neutrinos. Uh, today, we'll talk about neutrinos from the sun. Next week will be neutrinos from outside our solar system, and then we'll have a guest lecture on neutrinos in cosmology, neutrinos on the universe scale. Uh, and then we'll kind of come back to Earth, talk about neutrinos at nuclear reactors, how we measure the very small mass of the neutrino, we'll giving it away. Um, searches for additional fourth kinds of neutrinos, called sterile neutrinos. Uh, searches for CP violation, which is an effect that would make neutrinos and antineutrinos different, which could help explain this matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. And then finally, we'll, we'll wrap up with a sort of overview of what the big open questions in neutrino physics are, what the current and future experimental program to address them looks like. So to kick off, um, last week we had a, an introduction to neutrinos and sort of the history of how they were discovered, and we'll review that uh, just briefly. So. Neutrinos are fundamental particles. They are some of the smallest bits of matter that we know about. As far as we know, they're not made of anything else. They're as small as it gets. Um, they're very light and perhaps even have no mass at all. But we do know that they're at least about a million times lighter than the next lightest thing, which would be an electron. They have no electric charge. They're electrically neutral. And they interact very weakly with matter. So a neutrino can go through like many, many light years of, of lead without ever actually bouncing off of something. So they have these very weak interactions. Neutrinos were first discovered back in the, or the presence of neutrinos uh, was first postulated back in the 1920s. People were studying nuclear decays, particularly these so-called beta decays, where a nucleus spits out an electron, and it looked like energy was just vanishing. So people were very worried about energy conservation being broken, and so Wolfgang Cauley postulated that maybe energy conservation is okay, and you have some additional new particle that has to be neutral and really hard to detect that comes flying out of the nucleus along with the electron. This is the neutrino. It took about 30 years for someone to actually detect that particle in a laboratory. It happened in 1956. Uh, Cowan and Rhinus, sitting next to a nuclear reactor, first detected the neutrino. So this was Validated, this is really what's going on, and we have these, these new particles that we have to think about. We talked about the electron, which you'll find in an atom orbiting a nucleus, a little negatively charged electron. And we met its uh, heavier cousin, the muon, which was discovered in cosmic rays. It has a negative charge, same as the electron, it's just much heavier. And it has yet another, <laughs> even heavier cousin called the tau lepton which is negatively charged like an electron, but just super heavy. Now, each one of these, the electron, the muon, and the tau, gets its own neutrino pal that it interacts with. Specifically, the electron neutrino will interact with matter to produce an electron. An electron antineutrino, the antiparticle of the neutrino, will interact with matter to produce the positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron. Muon neutrinos interact to produce a muon. How neutrinos interact and produce a tau. So they all have their, their neutrino pals that they'll play with. And when these interactions do happen, it happens very rarely. They interact by a so called weak nuclear force, which is one of the fundamental forces of nature, and it doesn't happen very much at all. Again, neutrinos will just go through tons and tons of matter without ever interacting with anything. So that's the recap, and that brings us to today talking about neutrinos coming from the sun. So we have again our, our picture of the sun, and we would like to build a mathematical model of the sun so that we can predict how many neutrinos it produces and how many we could try to go detect here on Earth. 
So imagine the sun is sort of an onion with different layers and this very hot core, and that there are nuclear fusion reactions happening inside the core, which are sort of the highest energy processes we, we know about, so maybe that's what's making the sunshine. Um, so in these nuclear reactions deep in the core will produce photons, these particles of light, which will spend tens of thousands of years on average bouncing off of electrons in the sun, slowly diffusing outward before they finally get to the surface and make their way to Earth. Now by the time they get to the surface, they bounce around so much that they carry very little information about the original reaction that produced them. And so we can learn about what's going on on the surface of the sun by looking at the photons, but not what's happening inside. The neutrinos being produced in these nuclear reactions, on the other hand, since they don't interact with matter, they just go straight on through, make their way to Earth, and we can detect them. And they come straight from the source, so they can still contain information that we can learn about what's happening in these nuclear reactions deep within the core of the sun. So it's like a window inside the sun. So the game with solar neutrinos is neutrinos, the sun makes a whole bunch of neutrinos. We've set up a detector here on Earth and try to see them and thereby see inside the sun and understand whether we're right about this idea that nuclear fusion in the core is what's driving the sun. So when I say a nuclear chain reaction, I'm gonna be specific about what I mean. Um, so this was this whole theory was sort of worked out in the in the 1960s, and coming out of the Manhattan Project, the development of atomic energy. We have just learned a whole lot about nuclear physics. And so pioneering physicists like John McCall at Princeton took this and applied it to this problem. So if we imagine that the sun is driven by nuclear fusion reactions. Now we know how nuclear physics works and we can build a model of what's happening there. So this is one example of a nuclear chain reaction inside the sun. This is called the PP2 chain. And I'll just walk through it really fast. So we, it's called PP because we start with two protons. Uh, we have a boom here, and those will fuse together to form one nucleus in the very high energy, very dense core of the sun. Uh, so that forms the hydrogen 2 nucleus, which is a bound state with a proton and a neutron, and produce a positron, the anti electron, and uh, the neutrino, which I designate sort of a fuzzy blob there. The hydrogen 2 will go and find another proton nearby and fuse together with that to form helium-3, which is two protons, one neutron, and make a photon. Eventually that photon will make its way out and become sun sunlight. The helium-3 finds a near nearby helium-4, and those fuse together to make this much bigger nucleus, beryllium-7, producing another photon. Beryllium-7 eats an electron, turning a proton into a neutron, so that turns red there, to make lithium-7, that produces another electron-type neutrino. And finally, it all ends when it absorbs one more proton and you get two helium-4 nuclei, which are stable. So you start out with two protons using total chain reaction and you end up with some stable stuff. And then you're done. Um, along the way, making some photons and some neutrinos. So this is one way it can go. There's a couple different ways. So the PP2 is there to there to there to there to there. There's a couple of different routes you can take um, along the way producing photons or neutrinos. And no matter what, well, I highlighted the five different <coughs> sorts of neutrinos here in uh, different colors. And uh, no matter which way you take, you end up doing the same reaction. Uh, you start with four protons, you make a helium four nucleus, plus two positrons, two electron type neutrinos, two photons, and a bunch of energy that you know, fuels the sun. Uh, so every time we go through this one, any one of these chains, we get two electron-type neutrinos. So, we have some nuclear physics, and we have this onion model of the sun, and we would like to combine those to form a model of how the sun works. So we take what we know about the sun, which is actually quite a lot. We know the mass of the sun, we know the radius of the sun, we know approximately the age of the sun, we know how many photons are coming out of the sun. We measure the solar photons every day when we look outside. Uh, we know some nuclear physics, and using the photons that are coming off, we actually measure the chemical abundances of the elements on the surface of the sun. So we actually know quite a lot to start with. Uh, what we don't know 
is the temperature profile of the sun, like how you go from this, how hot is the core, how cool is the surface, and, and how that changes in between. And we need to know that in order to know the rates of all of these different reactions in this nuclear fusion chain, and therefore know how many neutrinos we would expect to produce. This is a really complicated problem to solve for, but essentially you take what you know and solve for what you don't know by feeding it into some giant computer. Mm -hmm. Supercomputer and ideas. <laughs> so the goal, again, is to take all that we know and look for, for each one of these five different reactions that produce neutrinos, see how many, how many of those we expect to produce, and therefore how many we would expect to detect here on. So what comes out of the computer program is something like this. So this is a, a, a figure showing the neutrino fluxes, which is how many neutrinos per square centimeter per second are going to be coming, uh, hitting the Earth as a function of the energy of that neutrino. So just like in the beta decays, where the electrons took on a broad range of energies, so too these neutrinos can take on a range of energies that will depend on the reaction that produced them. So there's five or so different, five different reactions that produce the neutrinos, <coughs> and so we have five different ranges of energies. So there's that one there, that one there, that one there, that one there, these two are just lines. And so the computer simulation tells us basically how tall each of these are, which is how many of each, of the ty each type of neutrino we would expect to see on Earth. So like when I say there's tens of trillions of neutrinos going through you per second coming from the sun. That's basically just taking this large number of neutrinos per square centimeter per second and multiplying it by the area of a human uh, to get how many neutrinos are going through you. That's all there is to it. So this solar model, uh, taking all these details of what we know about the sun and what we know about nuclear physics, is a prediction now of the neutrinos we expect to see on Earth. And as experimentalists, we just have to go to the So that brings us to Leeds, South Dakota, to the home state gold mine in the late 1960s. So this is a very deep gold mine. So you want to go really deep so you can get away from things that will fake a neutrino interaction, like cosmic rays coming from, from space. And uh, so we go deep underground, down to 4,850 feet underground, almost a mile and build a neutrino detector. So this is an experiment devised by Ray Davis. So uh, if you were here last week, you may remember for discovering that the neutrino and the anti-neutrino are distinct particles. And the way that he did that was by building an experiment that was sensitive only to electron-type neutrinos. Um, and he put that next to a nuclear reactor, which produces electron-type anti-neutrinos, and he didn't see anything. Uh, and thereby concluded that these were different particles. Now, the solar neutrinos are all supposed to be electron-type neutrinos. So he takes the same detector, puts it underground, and looks for these things. Perfect. So the way this is supposed to work is this is a big tank with 100,000 gallons of dry cleaning fluid, or chloroethylene, which has a bunch of chlorine in it. And so you want a solar neutrino to come from the sun, and interact with a neutron and turn one of those chlorine atoms into argon-37. Particle physics-wise, this is the reaction that's going on. We have this neutrino coming in and it exchanges a W boson, carrier of weak interaction, and flips a proton into it. Other way around, sorry. And for this interaction to happen, uh, that requires some minimum energy of the neutrino, which is 800,000 electron volts, which is our so the units we use in particle physics. But the point is there's, a, there's some minimum energy that that neutrino has to have to do this reaction. And because of that, this experiment is really looking at only the neutrinos above that, that threshold energy. So he's trying to measure the sum total of all of the neutrinos that are in this blue box. So that, that's what the experiment is trying to do. The way it works is kind of neat and, and really difficult. Um, so you let the thing sit there for a while, you have the solar neutrinos interacting, changing chlorines into argons. The argon-37 is unstable and will radioactively decay with a half-life of a few days or so. And, uh, and so we just let it sit there for a while. 
building up some of the argon-37, and then every once in a while, every few weeks, bubbles through helium gas, which will pick up the argons, maybe 10 argon atoms, 20 maybe, out of a 100,000 gallon tank. Then you extract the argon atoms out of your helium and throw them into a radioactive decay counter and try to look for the characteristic half-life of the argon-37 decaying away with something like 20 atoms. <coughs> so it's super difficult um, to do, uh, but that's, that's how it's done. And, and the, looking for this half-life, this decay, is a really unique signature. It's hard for anything else to fake that. Um, so the idea is you measure that, you count how many argons you have, and therefore you know how many neutrinos you had to interact, and can check that model of the sun. Super difficult though it is, he does the experiment and finds this data that's shown in red, that super sophisticated model based on nuclear physics, the prediction is shown in green. So this is bad. He's seeing about a third of the neutrinos that are expected. So this has people scratching their heads. Again, this is a really difficult experiment to do. Maybe there's something wrong with that. And so when we see a weird result, you know, the first thing a scientist wants to do is to <coughs> check it, to try to reproduce it. So a few more experiments come online. Same concept, but instead of using fluorine, they're now using gallium and watching for it to change into germanium, but it's really it's the same idea. One experiment called GALAX in Italy, a second experiment called SAGE in Russia, set out to do this, and they find basically the same deal. A serious deficit of solar neutrinos relative to the prediction of the photon. So here is the solar neutrino problem. We think we understand how neutrino production works in the sun. We have this nuclear physics model. We think we understand how neutrino detection works. We've been doing that for a few years now. We have a few different detectors trying. Uh, and yet, only about a third of the neutrinos are showing up. So, something is wrong here. Maybe we're wrong about production. Maybe we're wrong about detection. Maybe something's going on with the neutrinos. So, people thought about all these things, and yeah, we need to have some healthy skepticism. So as far as production goes, you know, this nuclear physics thing is, a lot of these measurements are new, maybe there's some uncertainties there, and we just have the nuclear physics wrong. Maybe we're wrong about our onion model of the sun, and there's turbulence in the sun, or something that's mixing together the inside and outside, and, and, and something's wrong about the temperature distribution. So we have the model of the sun drastically wrong. Uh, maybe there's just some kind of new physics going on in the sun that no one has ever seen before. As far as the detector side, how well you can, you can do this experiment, like extracting these 20 argon atoms from 100,000 gallons of liquid, um, it's hard to convince people that you haven't you know, only done a third as well as you think you can at that. So people have questions about the efficiency of detection. And there's a question of whether we're even seeing solar neutrinos at all. These experiments, do they just sit there and solar neutrinos come in and, and make argon and you see how many argons you have. But you don't know the energy of that neutrino or the direction that it came from. So you're not even really sure that they're coming from the sun. Um, thirdly, maybe everything's okay and something's going on with the neutrinos. So what we really like as a start is a different kind of experiment that can actually measure the energy of the neutrinos and their direction in real time. So we can see neutrino by neutrino uh, what the energy was and where it came from and try to see whether that's consistent with this, uh, this solar model. So here it enters the Kamio Kande detector in Japan. So this is a big cylinder full of water. It's about uh, 3,000 tons of water. 16 meters in diameter, and it's surrounded by about a thousand photomultiplier tubes. These are super sensitive light detectors capable of detecting a single photon. Uh, this looks a lot like those first, those very early neutrino detectors we saw last week, and, and you'll see a lot of neutrino detectors look a lot alike. It's a kind of a theme. Um, so the difference here is that this is filled with water, and the detectors we talked about last week were filled with liquid scintillator, like a flash of light when a charge of particle went through it. 
So, how are we going to detect neutrinos in this water detector? The idea is that you have a solar neutrino come down and just give a kick to an electron in your water. Particle physics wise diagram like that. And so, to understand what happens next, we have a little detour in special relativity. So, Professor Einstein tells us that nothing can travel faster than the speed that light travels, which is denoted by C. It's about 186,282 miles per second. So, nothing can exceed that speed limit. That's true in empty space. So, in a, in a vacuum of space, not in any material, that is the speed limit. And so, that the speed limit of light in empty space, nothing can exceed. In general, when light travels through a medium like air or water, it travels slower. And the factor by which it slows down is the index of refraction, so called, this letter N. And so in water, that number happens to be 1.33. And so light will only go 140,000 miles per second through water, not the ultimate speed. So, got to slow down in the water zone. Now, Think about these solar neutrinos. So the energies of these solar neutrinos are something like 15 million electron volts. So again, these particle physics units. Um, now if you imagine that the solar neutrino transfers all of its energy when it kicks an electron, so now we have an electron with 15 million electron volts of energy, we can use special relativity to calculate the velocity that that electron is traveling. And if you work that out, it's 186,000 miles per second. So very nearly the speed of light, which is faster than the speed of light in water. You might think this, this can't be, you can't travel faster than the speed of light. But again, the speed limit is the speed of light in a vacuum. It's okay to travel faster than the speed of light in water. Um, so what happens is sort of the equivalent of a sonic boat. If you have a fighter jet go faster than the speed of sound in air, and it is a sound wave, the sonic boom that you hear. And so when you have something going faster than the speed of light, it emits the equivalent. It emits a wave of light, which is called Cherenkov radiation. So I have a little animation here that sort of shows that. So you have a particle going along, and then you have these booms of light, like sonic booms. And they sort of add up together. And so what you end up with is a cone of light coming off of your electron that's going almost to be a light. So it produces this cone of photons, which you see in your detector now as a ring. Like that. All right, so this is an actual ring seen in an experiment. Uh, so you can look at the, the shape and size of this ring and see which way the particle came from and also what energy it had. So these folks coming up on day two. They do the experiment, and this is some results from their paper. On the left here, we have the distribution of the angles of the sun, where neutrinos coming from the sun are over on the right. Neutrinos going toward the sun are over on the left. And what you expect from the standard solar model is the solid black line that goes up there. And so you see there are some extra neutrinos coming from the sun, but not enough. And over on the right, we have the energy of the neutrinos. Again, the, the black line there is what's expected from the standard solar model. And the black points are what you get. And it looks right. It's the same shape, but they're just aren't enough. So the Kamiokande experiment is some proof that we really are looking at neutrinos coming from the sun. They're just aren't enough. A few years later, they think bigger and build Super Kamiokande also in Japan, which is a huge detector. This is 50,000 tons of water, surrounded by tens of thousands of photovoltaic tubes. So they do the same basic experiment with this and get the same basic answer. Looks right for solar neutrinos, they just aren't enough. I'll, I'll take one little uh, additional detour here to highlight um, another major contribution of the Super Kamio Monday. So you may remember, we also have these neutrinos that are being produced in the atmosphere. When cosmic rays come down, hit some atmosphere stuff, and create this shower of other particles. 
produces a whole bunch of neutrinos. So one could also build an experiment to look for these neutrinos and see whether they're consistent with expectation. And so Super Kamiokande does this, and does a great experiment, um, and discovers what is called the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. So again, we have some prediction and data points that show a deficit of neutrinos. So it's like these neutrinos produced by cosmic rays are also disappearing. So this gives its own name, like a solar neutrino problem. We have an atmospheric neutrino anomaly. And at the end of the day, this turns out to be the same root cause. That's what's going on with the solar neutrino. Uh, and so the, the results that come out of this and our discoveries about how neutrinos work are really, you know, the credit goes jointly to solar neutrinos and to atmospheric neutrinos. Um, we really needed both measurements to really understand it. Uh, but I will continue talking about solar neutrinos uh, since that's, that's what today is all about. Uh, I have a question, please. Sure. If neutrinos are in big they're coming from every day, which different direction. How do we know that we're um, attempting to measure the neutrinos that come from our sun? I don't see that. Right, so, the, uh, <laughs> so this direction. Uh, yeah, so the pointer is fighting. Um, so the ring you produce uh, gives you a measurement of the direction that the neutrino came from. The, the ring will be <coughs> pointed along the direction. Um, so you take something like that. And then in Kamiokande, when they measure that direction, they're looking for this upturn here. So you have, there are neutrinos that are that'll be coming from every which way, including the atmospheric neutrinos from the cosmic rays. Um, but you expect neutrinos from the sun to be preferentially pointed away from the sun. And so it's by measuring the angle along with everything else that, that lets you know that they're really solar neutrinos. But that was a big question that people had with the early results. Is, is in the early, in the first experiments, they so they don't know where they came from. It's, it's impossible to know. So that's, that's why experiments like this were needed. Okay. So, back to our solar neutrino problem. Um, so this is a really nice figure that summarizes kind of the state of the field. We have these experiments using a tank of chlorine from Ray Davis. We have these experiments that were the follow-ups using gallium, saved in Russia, Galax in Italy. And then the water-based experiments, Kamiokande and Super Kamiokande, all in one plot. And the blue, point, the, the blue bands are what they measure. And up here is what the theory predicts. So across the board, no one's seeing enough neutrinos. So by this point, you know, say what you might, I had your reservations about the, the first experiments and how it's really difficult to count the neutrinos, but now we have five different experiments that all confirm this. They've all done their own cross checks. So we think the detection side of things is okay. In the meantime, people have done better measurements of the nuclear physics, and so we're pretty sure that everything's okay on that side too. And so it's really, uh, the signs are pointing to something going on with the neutrinos. People have lots of ideas about what the cause could be, but I will skip to the punchline, sort of, uh, what we ultimately found to be the case, which is so-called neutrino oscillations. So the concept is this, that perhaps the solar neutrinos, they all start out from these fusion reactions as electron-type neutrinos. But perhaps on their journey to the Earth, they can change types into a muon or a tau-type neutrino. All these detectors, like Ray Davis's detector, are only looking for electron-type neutrinos because that's all that you would expect to see. And so muon or tau-type neutrinos would just be invisible and would just seem to disappear. So back to our kind of cartoon picture here. Uh, neutrino production looks okay, neutrino detection looks okay. Two thirds of the electron type neutrinos go missing. So maybe they're changing type. Yeah? Can one experiment uh, detect all three? 
Oh yeah, that's, that's coming up in the <laughs> Yeah. Excellent question. Um, so you might think, uh, now that you have a muon to that neutrino, that's supposed to interact with matter to produce a muon. So you build a detector that can look for muons. But Einstein strikes again. We have a neutrino with some amount of energy, and we're going to try to convert that energy into mass to produce a new particle, in this case, a muon. The energies of those solar neutrinos are something like 20 million electron volts. The electron weighs like a 40th of that. So a neutrino with this energy can easily produce an electron. The muon, however, is super heavy, recall, so it takes about five times more energy to produce a muon than any solar neutrino has. So these things just don't have enough oomph to E equals mc squared a muon, if you will. So they can't produce a muon or a tau. They just don't have uh, enough energy to do that. And so what you see is nothing. So electron neutrinos can produce electrons, but muon and tau type neutrinos can't produce muons and tau. Now, to understand how neutrinos might change type on their way to Earth, we're going to cover a teeny bit of quantum physics. I'll try to be brief. I think it's probably dangerous to do too much quantum physics before lunch. <laughs> There's two things that I, that I think are important to understand. So the first is so-called wave-particle duality, which is a statement that, on very small scales, sometimes things act like particles, and sometimes they act like waves. So all the fundamental particles that we talk about, we can think about light waves also. So to explain this, so we usually think about light as a wave. So it has a wavelength that sets the color, so red light has a longer wavelength, blue light has a shorter wavelength. And you can do experiments, like if you shine a light source at a wall with two slits in it, you see this interference pattern where you have peaks line up, with a peak or a trough line up with a peak in your wave and cancel out. So you get constructive and destructive interference. And it's just like if you had a wave machine and did this experiment with water, you'd see the same thing. So that's light as a wave. All good? What we learned in the 20s, thanks to Arthur Polly Compton, like uh, the lecture series namesake, that sometimes light can act like a particle. So if you take a high energy photon and fire it at an electron, they'll bounce off kind of just like billiard balls. And the electron or the, the photon will lose energy and change its wavelength in a way that is impossible to describe if you yeah. only treat light yes. as a wave. Hold on, please hold on. Now, uh, if you I guess we're used to thinking about electrons as a particle, it's a little chunk of matter. And if you fire an electron at another electron, it'll bounce off sort of like billiard balls. So fine, electrons are a particle. But somewhat surprisingly, electrons can also act like a wave. If you have a source of electrons, and you fire it at a wall with two slits in it, you will end up seeing the same kind of interference pattern as you would with light or water. It was really surprising to people at the time that the electrons themselves are acting like a wave. So back in the, in the 20s, Louis de Broglie said, OK, well, if electrons are a wave, we should be able to calculate what the wavelength is. And found this simple relation that the wavelength is some tiny number called Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So you can calculate the Planck's constant, or the, or the Broglie wavelength of, of anything, of a baseball or an electron. So that's thing number one. Sometimes we can think of, uh, think of particles like particles, and sometimes we can think of them like waves. They, they lack like either one depending on the situation. Point number two is the superposition of states. And this means that a quantum mechanical system can be in multiple states at the same time. So as a sort of analogy, in the classical world, say we have two kinds of pets. You can have a cat or you can have a dog. And when you come home, if you have a cat, you always have a cat. And if you come home and you have a dog, there's always a dog there. In quantum mechanics, there is a third kind, which is simultaneously a cat and a dog. And sometimes when you come home, there's a cat there. And sometimes when you come home, half the time you have 
a dog. Never do you come home and you have some kind of combination cat-dog. It's always one or the other. So when you measure it, you always get one state or the other. But you know that it is, in some sense, comprised of both. Because you'll measure one or the other in some probability way. I hope that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And apply this superposition of states and the wave particle duality to understanding how neutrinos can change time. So, first, I've been teaching about neutrinos having masses. So, we know that they have to be really light, but don't necessarily have to be nothing. So, let's assume that the neutrino has a tiny but non zero mass, a million times lighter than an electron. Further, let's say that. The neutrinos that are produced in the weak interactions, so the familiar new electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino, they don't have a definite mass. You can't say what the de Broglie wavelength for one of these guys is. Instead, they're built up out of some other neutrinos that do have a definite mass, which we uncreatively call nu1, nu2, and nu3. And these Nu1, Nu2, and Nu3 have distinct, well-defined masses, and therefore they have different wavelengths. And we can add those waves together to build up what we call a new E, a new U, or a new tau. So you take some fractions, some different combinations of these waves, add them together, and call it new E, new mu, and new tau. Or conversely, the weak interactions produce an electron type neutrino, which is some particular combination of these things. So we have waves adding together. The neutrinos are now acting like waves, and they're in multiple states at the same time. So that's a bit of an analogy. We can think about sound waves. It's a bit more familiar. So if we had two sound waves with slightly different frequencies, say 400 hertz and some little bit higher frequency, 400 or something. Um, and we add those waves together, we'll see an interference pattern, where sometimes the peaks line up and we get something big, and sometimes the peaks and troughs cancel out and we get nothing. So I think I should be able to play a sound here. Are you saying the neutrinos interact with each other? So, right, so they're, they're composed of, of these three different waves, uh, which can interfere with each other. Okay. Um, so if we listen to uh, 400 hertz, or a slightly different frequency, close enough that it's indistinguishable, and then we play them on top of each other, you hear this interference pattern. So you can get something that looks different from either of, either of these waves. So what happens with the neutrinos when we have these new one, new two, and new three waves that are now interacting and interfering with each other like sound waves, is that we can get waves of neutrinos. So we can, say, start out with a particular mixture of new one and new two, which we call an electron type neutrino, where, say, our peaks line up, and then at some point where our peaks and troughs line up, we might have a different mixture which we would call new mu, the new type neutrino. And at some point later, you know, things line back up, and we're back to the point where we started with, with what we would call an electron type neutrino. In between, it's, it's something, it's some mixture. And so, it's sort of like having your, your cat and dog. You'll measure it, it'll look like either a muon or an electron type neutrino in your detector, but there's a random chance that you'll get one or the other. So what we might like to do, if we'd like to see whether this is really going on, is build a neutrino detector you know, everywhere between here and the sun, and try to measure the wavelength over which these changes happen, and also the amplitude, meaning whether all of these turn into muon type, or only some of them, or so on. Yeah? So you started the discussion talking about the assumption that there's a tiny non-zero mass. Right. And when this all was playing out in the real world, 
we heard that these experiments, the, the one you're probably going to get to shortly, uh, proved that there was a non-zero mass. And I don't see from this uh, interference issue how the mass plays in this. Sure, yeah. So it's, the idea is that the, the new one, new two, and new three, to have some well-defined Broglie wavelength, have to have some well-defined mass. So, so those have masses. And, and if none of those have any masses, then you, you can't, they wouldn't have different wavelengths, they wouldn't interfere, and this wouldn't happen. So, so it requires that at least one neutrino, or one of the new one, new two, and new three, has to have a different mass than the others. It's not quite clear. Are you saying that each neutrino is composed of three, like, quark neutrinos? So they're not built out of anything in the sense that that there is structure within the neutrino, but they're sort of all three at once in the sense of this, this quantum mechanical sense that your, your cat and dog can be both at once, but you always measure it to be one or the other. So the, the actual the neutrino is a real object, but these N1 and 2 and N3 are kind of hypothetical objects? Yeah, it depends on which question you ask, which one you would think about as being a real object. Like if you ask which one can you measure the mass of, or which one has a well-defined mass, it would be the new one, two, and three. But the new E, new mu, and new tau are the ones that we can detect, because those are the ones that will participate in weak interactions. So there's kind of two different ways of thinking about the neutrinos that are, that are equivalent at some level. Yeah, so I, so I simplified things a little bit for this slide by leaving out the third, but, but in principle there, there are three different ways interacting in a, in a somewhat more complicated way, and you will end up with, with tau neutrinos showing up at various points. The mass is so much different. Um, no, it really depends on, uh, on, a, on a few things. Um, there's fundamentally how different the masses are, and also uh, just what those pie charts look like, which is not predicted by any theory, it's just a constant of nature we have to measure. Sure. Yeah. 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 You talk about uh, the anti neutrino, mm -hmm. and it, within those pie charts of one, two, and three, to make it anti, do those proportions change then for an electron? Uh, so, there's a, a whole other set of anti neutrinos. Oh. Summarizing, there's three kinds of neutrinos. They have three different masses, therefore three different wavelengths. Right, and then I would just add that the, the three neutrinos that we've talked about so far, the electron, the one, and tau, um, are composed of three different sorts of neutrinos that have masses. And therefore different, each one different wavelengths. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah so we have an electron type neutrino is made out of some combination, new one, new two, and new three, that have different masses. So now the electron type neutrino has whatever masses that combination gives you. <coughs> but those, those waves, the new one, new two, and new three, can interfere with each other, which lets you have some different combination of masses later on. It's pretty weird. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, when you use the word oscillation, obviously it connotes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I'm not sure I'm quite clear on what's oscillating from what to what. And if if it did oscillate from a solar neutrino, elect electron neutrino, into the other kinds that these first experiments were not. Depicting, wouldn't they oscillate back to solar neutrinos and then wash, you know, the, 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 the destructive interferences cancel each other? Right. Um, so yeah, so you would still expect to find the same number. Yes, no? Yeah, so, so in, the, in the whole picture, um, I think you're about to say things get, get washed out 
maybe. It would, and, and so when you, you have all these different sources of neutrinos, and they're being produced all over the sun, um, you have to average over all of that. And so what ends up happening is that you, you can't detect the wiggles, but after, after a long time it averages to some number. So you, if you're oscillating between electron type neutrinos and muon type neutrinos, then you would expect not to measure one or the other all the time, but maybe 50% on average. Um, so we're, we're, in the experiments, we're really detecting averages. This has to have a, a certain mm -hmm. wavelength. Mm -hmm. The beats have wavelength. Yeah. And so you detect different amounts of mixtures depending on how far the Earth is away, or how far the detector is from the Earth. Now, does, does that come out if we have a, a detector and you stick it out at the Mars? Uh, so you'll still end up averaging things out. Um, you'll, you'll still end up averaging things out just because neutrinos are coming from all over the sun, so you don't know the exact path length that they took. Yeah, but you would expect a different answer at a different distance. Um, not necessarily. So, so when things get, get averaged out, it, it's um, well, or, there's some additional complications we'll, we'll come to later. But uh, you know, if you had equal equal parts electron and muon, then once it once it's averaged out by looking over the whole sum, <coughs> overall energy used, overall radii, you would just expect to get 50-50, no matter how far away you go. Is it true that the weight or the mass of a neutri neutrino gets larger and smaller as it travels? Uh, in, in some sense, yes. Um, so, so there's some more mathematical treatment one has to do to account for kind of exchanging E equals mc squared to, to exchange between energy and mass, um, since the total energy of the system can't change. And is the motion of the proton that the neutrino is hitting, or the neutron, is that taken into account? Because if the Proton is the, if the particle is moving towards the neutrino, you're going to get more energy in the collision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a fairly small effect, but it has to be accounted for for a detailed analysis. Yeah. So, what is the order of magnitude of these of the wavelength of these oscillations? Is it meters or kilometers or light years? Ah, um, Um, so it depends on, on a few things. Uh, it depends on the energy of the neutrinos. So, so I'm thinking for, well, I, I, had to, I had to work it out. I guess it cannot be light years because yeah, yeah, the yeah. averaging has to happen between yeah. the sun and the earth. doesn't have a perfectly circular orbit, so it has a, right. an aphelion and perihelion. Mm -hmm. Has there been any difference noticed between uh, the opposite points of the orbit at all? Uh, hmm. So I think people have tried to look for that kind of thing, but it, since it gets averaged out somewhat, I think it's hard to, hard to do. It's yeah. small, it's small. <coughs> thinking that on any neutrino, any of the three, has a half-life? For instance, does the tau neutrino eventually just spontaneously break down into other neutrinos? Um, so, a certain amount of time. Yeah, so they, they won't decay in the sense they of radioactive really decay. They can change type like this. Do they have a half-life? Um, yeah, not, not in the sense of a decay. Like radioactive decay. Right, yeah. Okay. So they, they'll also be Neutrinos are not traveling at the speed of light. There must be a rest frame, at least for each individual neutrino. Now, how does that affect these neutrino oscillations? When you measure a neutrino, 
Ocean's Restroom. Um, are you good? I'm sure you understand the question. Um, I mean, you, you, can do the, you can do the whole analysis in, in the restroom of a, of a neutrino, and you have to get the same answer. Okay, well, but the uh, implication of your slide is that they're traveling through some distance. Yeah. So they will fluctuate in their own rest frame. Right. So it's, it's, so there's, it's, it's the relative uh, frequencies of the different components that lead to the oscillation pattern that will have to work out the same, regardless. All right. Let's. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so perhaps for the enthusiasts. We can be a little bit more quantitative. Um, so again, in a scenario where we only have two neutrinos, um, so we have a new one and a new two, just an electron and neon type, we can express the electron type neutrino as some fraction new one plus some fraction new two, and the same for the new ones. And do a little quantum mechanics to work out what the probability is that you start out with an electron type neutrino and you still end up electron type neutrino. And this will depend on the pointers, the distance that you travel, the neutrino energy, so you kind of know those for your experiment, and then two things that are just constants of nature that no theory tells you you just have to go measure. One is the difference in the masses between nu1 and nu2, which will set the kind of the B frequency of the interference. And the other is this term, which is just a number between 0 and 1, uh, which kind of tells you uh, what the overall scale of that probability is. So this gives you a model you can go in front of it. There's one additional complication here, uh, which I think people have already alluded to, uh, which is that matter matters. Um, so we know that like, when light travels through a medium, this index of refraction means that it goes slower, and that will affect the propagation of light. So it's not that any particular photon is going to hit a water molecule and bounce off. It's just the mere presence of the water will affect the path that a light beam takes. And there's a kind of similar story for neutrinos. Because they're traveling through the sun, uh, there's a very the medium that they're traveling through is a whole bunch of electrons. And the electrons will affect the, these oscillation patterns in a, in a fairly complex way. Um, and so it's not that the neutrinos are bouncing off of an electron and doing something, it's just the, the fact that they are traveling through this soup of electrons. Um, so this is known as the NSW effect, named after Mikhail Smirnov and Wolfenstein, or simply the matter effect. So that turns out to be, uh, be a big deal for these electrons as well. So let's get back to the concept here. Um, the idea is that we produce electron type neutrinos in the sun. <coughs> Some of them are changing type and become undetectable on Earth. So you know, wouldn't it be great if we could have a detector that could see all three types? So that is the Submarine Neutrino Observatory, the so-called snow experiment, uh, which is up in a mine underground in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, and produced its first results around 2001. All neutrino detectors looking kind of similar. Uh, here's what snow looks like. So this is in a nickel mine, not gold, over a mile underground. It's super deep. Um, and it's a sphere this time, not a cylinder. About 18 meters in diameter, surrounded by 10,000 of these photomultiplier tubes. And unlike Kamiokande, it's filled with a material called heavy water, about 1,000 tons of it. But you detect neutrinos in much the same way. You have your neutrino coming in. It takes an electron, for example, that produces this cone that gives you a ring in your detector. And you can use the ring to see where your neutrino came from. Now the heavy water, kind of the secret sauce for this new experiment. Normal water is H2O, hydrogen and two oxygens, where you just have a plain old hydrogen, so a proton with an electron flying around it. The heavy water, this is Hydrogen 2, or deuterium, where you take your hydrogens and you give it a bonus neutron. 
So instead of water made with H2O, it's, it's the same except all of the hydrogens have an extra neutron in the nucleus. So it gets a little bit heavier, one neutron heavier per mole. So what makes heavy water great is that there are several different kinds of reactions that neutrinos can have that you can try to look for. The first is called the charged current reaction. This is when an electron type neutrino turns, uh, so you start with your neutron proton in your hydrogens. It will convert one a neutron into a proton and an electron coming out. So you can detect this electron, look for the ring, and you know that you have an electron type neutrino. And if you agree with everyone else, you should see about a third or so of the neutrinos that you expect. But there's a second kind of reaction, called the neutral current reaction where any old kind of solar neutrino can just break this thing up. So you don't need enough energy to create a muon. You just need enough energy to break up a neutron and a proton bound together. When you do that, you have a neutron now floating around the detector, which you can try to detect. So you count electrons, tell you how many electron type neutrinos you have. That should be about a third of what's predicted. And you detect neutrons to tell you how many across all three types you have. And that should now agree with the standard model of prediction. All right, so SNOW is going to measure electron type, we expect a third, and all types, we expect to see all of them simultaneously using this heavy water. <coughs> Back to this uh, picture here. Again, we have chlorine experiments, the gallium experiments, and water experiments, all seeing kind of 30 to 50 percent of what's expected. So we run the snow experiment, look for the electron type neutrinos, and you get about a third, just like everyone. Now, fireworks. <laughs> look at uh, all three types of neutrinos, and, and finally, something consistent with now, something consistent with the standard solar model. So there's a very detailed analysis that goes into this, looking at the energy distribution, of course the angular distribution of these neutrinos to confirm that this is consistent with this model of these oscillating neutrinos. Um, of course it's done. Um, the bottom line outcome of this is that the neutrinos can and do change type all the way from the sun. This demands, because the whole thing is built on adding together these waves that have different masses, this requires that neutrinos have a small but non-zero mass. And the reason we have this whole problem in the first place is that these early experiments were only looking for electron type neutrinos. So this is huge news. This is textbook writing kind of big news. In the 70s, when people wrote down the standard model of particle physics, there was no evidence that neutrinos had any sort of mass or did anything like this. So all the particle physics textbooks literally had to be rewritten in order to account for neutrino mass. This is the biggest news you get in particle physics. Um, and for that achievement, um, the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to uh, Mark McDonald, who was the spokesperson of the SNOW experiment, and Takaki Pajita of Super Kamio Kande. Um, recall they were not only looking at the solar neutrinos, but also this atmospheric neutrino anomaly. That was a really big part of the puzzle. And the prize went for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. So, hooray, uh, all is well with solar neutrinos. But the, the case is not entirely closed. We still have some solar neutrino problems today that, that we're looking into. So I'll try to just give you a flavor of um, what, we're, what we're doing today. So there's many different reactions happening in the sun in the PD fusion chain. Uh, shown here, you know, all the different uh, the, 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 the five different neutrino reactions that will all produce neutrinos that have different ranges of energies. And so to really say that we understand what's happening inside the sun, uh, we want to understand each and every one of these and make sure that it matches. So how are we doing? The first results, uh, all these neutrino oscillation results from snow were based on measuring these guys, these boron-8 solar neutrinos. 
sort of gets easier to measure as you go to the right. Higher energies are easier to measure, and up, uh, higher fluxes. There's just more neutrinos to look at, so um, it sort of makes sense that this, that's where things start. Um, so that's you know in the around the year 2000. Um, subsequently, there's a new detector on the scene called Orexino in Italy, which is a 300 ton liquid simulator detector. Uh, around 2008, they measured these lines here, the beryllium-7 neutrinos from this reaction. A little bit later, they measured the so-called PEP neutrinos right here. And in 2014, this was a really challenging measurement to make because the energies are so low. The first step in the reaction, the, the PEP neutrinos. Thing. So the only one that actually hasn't been definitively observed yet is these, these guys down here, just because they're so weak, there's so few of them to try to detect the AGP neutrinos. Um, but I can assure you we're working hard on it. This is my PhD thesis from 2016, which is an attempt to detect these using the Snow experiment. So, uh, work in progress. Uh, another interesting thing people are, are looking at with the solar neutrinos is, is the so-called CNO cycle, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. This is a full second fusion chain that happens right alongside the, the PP reactions. Um, the PP chain is like 99% of the sun's energy. And this is maybe one or two percent, but it's expected to be a big player in larger stars. Uh, so that's one reason to look for it. Another is the so-called solar metallicity problem. People measure the composition of the sun using the photons on the surface, and they use it measuring how the sun vibrates, like sunquakes, uh, called helioseismology. And measuring the composition of the sun in these different ways disagrees. And so there's hope that by measuring these neutrinos that come out of this chain reaction, you can measure how many carbon, nitrogen, and oxygens there are, uh, and thereby get a new handle on what the sun is made of. Uh, like a kind of a way to look inside the sun. Uh, so it's really difficult to do, though, because these are also very faint. Um, so this is what Borosino would see, which is buried underneath all these other different kinds of neutrino interactions. Um, so it's really a needle in a haystack. But just to say how excited people are, here's a paper from a few months ago. The CNO group neutrino grand prix, the race to solve the solar metallicity problem. And you know, when people start making auto racing puns, you can tell they're excited. <laughs> um, a final thing uh, that's interesting to look at is so called non standard interactions. Any other funny business happening in the sun? So, this, this plot is the probability that an uh, electron neutrino is still an electron neutrino on Earth. Um, after Maybe this, this helps address some of the early questions. You have to average over the entire radius of the sun where neutrinos are being produced and the energies that you're measuring. Um, and so what you end up with is some, some average probability for detecting a neutrino. And because of these interactions with the matter in the sun, that changes as a function of the neutrino energy. So with low energies, it's kind of constant. You expect the, the probability that an electron neutrino is still an electron neutrino is like 50%. And so that's what Orbsian is looking at. At higher energies, it's more like 30%. That's what Snow is measuring. But in this region in between, the shape of this curve is extremely sensitive to those interactions with the matter of the sun. And it's a desert. There are no measurements there. But if there's some kind of new fundamental forces that impact how the neutrinos would move through the sun, the shape of this curve is a very sensitive way to test that, to look for a kind of new, beyond the standard model kind of interactions. And so people were really excited about building experiments to go after that. In building experiments, we are. Uh, there's Orexino continues to bear a lot of fruit. The SNOW experiment has been upgraded. Uh, it will be coming online soon to look at solar neutrinos uh, as SNOW Plus. Uh, so it's a 300 ton liquid simulator. Uh, thousand tons of liquid scintillator and then tens of thousands of tons of liquid scintillator has been proposed in China, uh, as well as some kind of megaton scale uh, experiment in Japan and, and large detectors in the US that can also kind of go after this. So there's a whole slew of new experiments coming online to try to address these questions. Let's just kind of sum things up. Uh, so we had the solar neutrino problem, home state experiment and others didn't see enough neutrinos. We invented this new model where neutrinos are made in these interfering waves, and that allows them to change type on their way to the Earth. The SNOW experiment dramatically confirms that hypothesis, and therefore we learn, together with the atmospheric neutrinos, 
that neutrinos can change type and thus have a So, looking ahead to the weeks to come, uh, we can also look beyond the solar neutrinos. This, uh, this lecture we've talked about. This little sliver of all of the natural neutrino sources across 24 orders of magnitude and energy. Um, so next week we'll talk a little bit about the supernova neutrinos and some of the very high energy neutrinos uh, that we see coming at us from space. And then after that, um, we'll have a discussed lecture on neutrino cosmology. We'll try to talk about some of the very low energy stuff. And uh, yeah, then we'll, we'll come back to Earth. Uh, I'll leave you with uh, this beautiful picture from the Super Kamiokande experiment, which is an image of the sun as seen in, in New Dreams. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe, um, since we're running a little bit late, we can do um, like 10 or 15 minutes of questions, and then people can come up after if you have more. Um, anything to pick us off? Yeah, we covered a lot of ground in the middle of it. Uh, so the question was whether there are any absolute measurements of the neutrino mass, which is a, a fantastic question. So the, the oscillations only depend on the mass differences between the states. Um, and so they tell us nothing about neutrino masses. We only know that. Uh, since you know the differences, you can say if the lightest one is zero, you know, how light could the heaviest one be? Um, so there's a whole other experimental program that's trying kind of different ways of getting at that question. Um, kind of the, the first way people look at it, um, and where, it, where our current limits come from, is um, going back to beta decay. So the shape of that curve will be different if the neutrino has mass. Uh, it'll change, you need a little bit of extra energy to produce the neutrino mass. So it'll change the shape of that curve a little bit. So people look at extremely sensitive experiments trying to measure the shape of the electron energy spectrums in beta decay to try to measure the neutrino mass. But it's not known. Is there a model that can tell the heat Another excellent question um, about the heat. So, so that's something that's really funny, and it's a big open question, is so the neutrinos are uh, you know, at least a million times lighter than, than the electron. Um, and so if people like to show a plot you know, in a long scale where you have all the known particles and the neutrino down there in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so it's unclear whether the mechanism that causes the neutrino masses is the same. So if it is the, the, the same Higgs mechanism, you would have to, you, you're able to tune the, the masses that, that particles have, and you have to tune it to some tiny number to get this. And so people wonder whether there's some other reason, or whether it's just kind of arbitrary or tiny. But it's, it's an open question of, of why neutrinos have a mass. Yes? What's the carbon footprint on one of these experiments? Hmm. The electric bill. So the, uh, the electric bill would actually be quite modest compared with, with, say, a particle accelerator or something like that. These are really, they're, they're passive detectors that they just kind of sit there and wait. Um, so they actually don't use, you know, the, the energy that's used is, is powering the, uh, the electronics and the computers that, that read the data. But that's, running the, running the machine itself is, is very low. We, we like to reuse existing lines. So you get chili for free. <laughs> One scientist calculated the speed of uh, the neutrinos, knowing that all of them were less than the speed of light. Why did some scientists still think some had zero mass? Because they had zero mass and had met. That was a particle when we traveled half the speed of light. Well, that was the um, Not yeah. this particle traveled half the speed. Right. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what, what calculation you use, but... They still insist that I knew one of the sisters working on that. They said, no, I still think they made it zero. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of a... Yeah, it's, it's, they're kind of one of the same shape, that if something is traveling up to the speed of light, it should have a mass. Yeah, but I have a mass. So, so. 
But that is another the conventional thing about neutrinos. And they're, they're very close to the speed of light, but not quite. Which has you know, other fun consequences we can come back to. But there's, there's a big difference in terms of the physics of whether something is going to speed of light or only almost the speed of light. Because you have you run into problems with relativity, and then it can help on the <laughs> you couldn't do well, yeah. Given the range of probabilities for each of the transgender neutrinos, trans <laughs> it obviously affects their, their speed in space. Yeah. Uh, does that must affect the, also the, uh, the frequency of the changes? Right. So, so we imagine the you know, sort of like extended sound waves, um, the, the different components of the neutrino is some, some wave that is propagating through space and, and will you know, you superimpose these three waves on, on top of each other and, and uh, the interference has changed. Um, so it's just, you know, whatever particular combination of those three waves you have, will set how it, whether it acts like an electron you want or how it and the probabilities of those possibilities. In any of the detectors, has the uh, neutrino and clock changing? Um, so we always, when you measure it, you always measure it as one of the three. Um, like my, uh, my pet analogy, if you always come home and you have a, a cat, and you don't know whether you always had a cat or whether it's the, the random cat dog. Um, there are definitely, uh, you know, so, so this is one, one piece of evidence, right, that we know we start with electron type neutrinos and we end up with, with something else. Um, there's other experiments um, that we'll, we'll get more to later where you produce neutrinos using particle accelerators, where you use higher energy neutrinos from cosmic rays, and, uh, and can actually produce the new one for the cow. Um, and so that may be a bit more direct evidence that you know, you, you know what, what you ended up with, not only what you did. Yes, sir. Um, since neutrinos are leptons and uh, electrons, uh, muons and phons are leptons also, is there any reason why nature singled out neutrinos for this oscillation phenomenon? In other words, uh, can we sleep at night uh, knowing that our electrons are not uh, suddenly becoming neurons? Or? Yeah, but what's, uh, what's interesting is, uh, so the uncertainty principle you know, makes it impossible to know what kind of neutrino you have, uh, which is not the case for the charged leptons. You know, so we can uniquely associate a mass with each of the leptons that undergo the weak interactions. So the, the electron that interacts with the electron type neutrino you know, has a definite mass. And so we think of that as being, you know, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the, the masses and, and the, the weak interaction kind of particles. And so there's, in that sense, only one kind of electron. You don't have this subdivision into you know, different kinds of states like I guess allowed for the neutrinos because they're unmeasurable. But what is the reason for each electron, I mean, for the masses being um, so distinguished? Uh, exactly. Yeah, I don't think you there's. Have a right, I mean, I don't think there's a, a good explanation for why, in the current standard model, of why you know, electrons versus neutrinos should act so differently. Okay, it's just a consequence of, of what the mass has come out to. But they happen to be so big. And you're saying we can't sleep at night. Yeah, I think, I think we're safe. You're not going to turn into nuance. <laughs> along 
along the way. Um, there, there were many hats. Um, so I mentioned my, my PhD dissertation was on trying to make first measurement of the so far unmeasured uh, ETP neutrinos using the snow detector. Um, and there's there's hope that that would be possible, um, although it's, it'll be close, whether when there's snow has the capability to see them. Uh, so we're going to um, And uh, the snow plus experiment that I mentioned, um, is the main goal of that experiment, uh, so we will look at some of things, but the main goal is actually making a measurement of the computer mass. So I work on that also. Um, and finally, um, after that, is that I'm involved in the searches for sterile neutrinos, so it's additional fourth kinds of neutrinos that don't interact with weak interactions using the neutrino beams that are turned left. So do you think that's a possibility? Do you think that all these experiments they did? They would have found it if it was there. Yeah, so, so we'll have a, a whole talk on, on this, the, the, the sterile neutrinos. Um, you mean the, the sterile neutrinos, right? The additional fourth kinds of neutrinos. Yeah, um, so what we know is that these weak interactions, there's only three kinds that interact with it. They could be, the reason they're, they're called sterile neutrinos is that they don't interact with anything. But perhaps if they have mass, they would interact gravitational. It would be the only, the only way that they interact with anything. So you can never detect them directly. But they could have an impact. If they will also be, now we need a, a new four. So there's one more wave in there. Um, and so when we add that, that can change the way that the interferences happen for the regular neutrinos. And so we can try to look for irregularities in these interference patterns to try to in, yeah, infer the existence of some additional neutrinos, even if it doesn't interact. And there, there are experiments that have found anomalies. So that's why we're, we have this whole program we're building. But, uh, so let's say you only know, get one question in the What about the neutrino? What would that question hmm. I, I would ask a trick, that's probably a trick question. Um, I would ask what the. Uh, CP violating phase of the Majorana neutrinos. Let me know. Because I'm asking five questions in one. Um, so we, we have this idea, yeah. Uh, I talked to a, the genie. Um, so we have this idea that uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos can act differently. Uh, that might explain this matter anti antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Um, and, and so there's some number that indicates the amount of difference. Um, and so if you have that, then if you can measure the neutrino mass, there's a, well, we'll talk about more in, in different lectures, but um, basically I'm asking what, what, what that, that number is, which would tell me a lot about it. It's it's So the neutrino does interact with the Higgs boson because it has some mass. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's a yeah, it's an open question of of whether the, the interaction with the Higgs boson is tuned to make the masses so small, or whether there is some other reason, and perhaps the neutrinos, for whatever reason, don't interact with the Higgs, and there's some completely different fundamental mechanism. Well, that's true. That would just na more naturally lead to them being so light. Yes. yes. If after study is determined that uh, there is a neutrino that has no mass, is it possible that it could actually move faster than the speed of light? Oh, even massless would just go to the speed of light. So there was some excitement in a, a couple of years ago from people that thought they had seen neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, the Icarus experiment, um, which uh, you know, turned out to be just an instrumentation problem. But really, it was, you know, as far as we know, I mean, unless relativity is, is wrong and we need a, a new model, that would be. It's a wave, maybe sometimes a particle, sometimes if it's a wave, but not faster than 
No, you, the wave will still propagate at, at the speed of light or less. So that's, a, that's the best you could do. Um, faster than light neutrinos, but that would have been cool. <laughs> Alright, well thanks again. And, uh, see you next week.